Rebecca, you're muted. Thanks. Welcome, everybody. Sorry to be muted. Um, I think folks are slowly trickling in. So maybe as folks join, um, I will ask our guest speaker to describe uh, why we are not using Zoom and why why we're using WebEx today. Yeah, uh, we're negotiating with Zoom. Uh, and because uh, Zoom had previous records of kicking people out that didn't, um, you know, warn them beforehand when they talk about things sensitive to the PRC Beijing regime. Uh, and so we're, we're negotiating with them so that uh, if they implement proper controls for that sort of things and end-to-end -end encryption on web clients and so on, uh, then maybe we'll be back on better terms. But for now, let's use this more ancient version uh, of Zoom, I guess. <laughs> Awesome. Um, so like I said, welcome to our guest today. Uh, my name is Rebecca Williams. I'm currently a fellow at Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center's Technology for Public Purpose project. Um, and this seminar is a part of that series. Um, I'll, I'll go over like a couple logistics and the run of show and introduce our, our guest speaker tonight and then um, go through a set of questions. I, I think we're already recording and this will be published online afterwards. So um, that's the first log logistical note. Um, don't put any questions in here that you don't feel comfortable having publicly available online afterwards forever. Um, another logistical note, um, folks are encouraged to put questions into the Q&A chat throughout the ses session. We'll get to them in the last 15 minutes or so, as many as we can. Um, so just trickle them in there. Um, in terms of run of show, I'm hoping to cover three different types of topics tonight with Audrey. We'll see, see how deep we go into each. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, different opportunities and responsibilities across sectors. So Audrey's worked in the private, public, and social sector. I've worked in two of those as well, and I think it's a shared experience we can talk about. Um, so all the angles of play there. The second topic that I want to go through is discussing uh, participatory versus passive data collection techniques. Um, for folks that are familiar with my fellowship work, I'm researching smart cities right now, and this comes up a lot and um, it's deeply involved with Audrey's work. So I think we'll, we'll have some interesting things to talk about there. And then the last, just sort of looking at things from different angles question will be um, global relationships. So anything that you can think of there, East versus West, different ways to think. Um, I think that is it for run of show. Um, I'm, pr I'm excited to talk to Audrey, as mentioned, because we have these shared experiences of working um, inside and outside. Um, and I think that helps you um, to appreciate challenges as well as opportunities and how these issues are very collective and everyone has to join in. Um, in terms of Audrey's uh, bio, Audrey, you're welcome to describe sort of like your coming up story. Um, but in preparation for this, I just jotted down your job description which I, I know you've said in many podcasts before, but I think folks will appreciate. Um, so for folks that aren't familiar, um, Audrey Tang is the digital minister for Taiwan and wrote their own job description. It's a poem prayer. Um, it goes, uh, when we see internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And then when we hear the singularity is near, let us remember the plurality is here. So I think that's beautiful and also sets us up for this many angled discussion. Um, so yeah, without further ado, Audrey Tang, welcome. Thank you for being here. Welcome. And um, yeah, and I might add that uh, when we see uh, the smart cities is near, let's remember smart citizens are here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, very good. You can write my job description. Um, <laughs> so maybe a first question in that first section of um, question sections, uh, what do you see as unique opportunities and responsibilities across sectors? Mm -hmm. and, and maybe 
drawn from your own experience or uh, colleagues? Certainly. So um, my work uh, involves building uh, people, public, private partnerships, meaning that the social sector sets the norm, the public sector amplifies the norm, and the private sector will implements but also scales out the norm. And in this social sector-led approach, for example, during the presidential election in 2020, January in Taiwan, the prevailing norm was that um, the counting of each vote is public, uh, live stream recorded by YouTubers of all the different political parties. Um, even if people don't believe the other parties YouTubers, well, they sure believe their own. And they all develop their apps uh, that tallies the count. And so because of that remarkably uh, low um, penetration and uh, spread uh, was um, seen on the disinformation around election manipulation. And people uh, actually clamored for that uh, from the social sector uh, since 2014, actually since much longer, but the Occupy movement in 2014 really put it in focus. So people, for example, went into the National Auditing Office uh, bringing out carbon copies because there was no open data about campaign donation expenditure advertisement and so on. Uh, and then uh, we uh, in the GovZero movement helped digitizing it uh, using what we call OCR, Otaku Character Recognition. Uh, so like solving captures, people help uh, restoring uh, the digital numbers from those scanned copies. The National Audit Office was like, you, know, you can't be sure even if three people look at each cell, uh, you can't be sure it's 100% correct. And we're like, yeah, of course, you're in the public sector. You should amplify the norm. You should publish those numbers. So the investigative journalist can do this job. So in 2018, the public sector, after being pressured for four years, did actually open uh, data, the raw data of the campaign donation expenditure. And then uh, everyone discovered uh, that the social media companies like Facebook, the advertisements, was not classified as campaign donation or expenditure. It was not seen uh, in the audit office records. So the campaign donation uh, is domestic only, but foreign sponsorship of advertisement in 2018 was possible, and they are not uh, required to disclose anything. Um, and so Facebook, of course, pushed back a little bit when we negotiated that, but because the social sector threatened social sanction. So we did not actually pass any new laws vis-a-vis uh, -vis Facebook, but actually Facebook in 2019, Taiwan became the first jurisdiction where they implemented to this whole real-time open data advertisement library thing. But that's not because the state is particularly strong, but rather because the, the state has previously already resisted uh, and failed to resist and therefore joined the social sector in their norm mm -hmm. setting. So this is just one small anecdote, but I hope that you see the shape of the uh, people-public-private partnership from this. Yeah, absolutely. For uh, viewers that might be, not be familiar with uh, GovZero's work, I, I certainly became familiar with GovZero when I was working at the NGO in the U.S. Sunlight Foundation, and we had like a, a couple collaborative events even with like the open yep. legislative data. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very encouraged, but also for folks who aren't familiar with it, GovZero, their URL is... Um, G0V. It's the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, G0V. Mm -hmm. It, it's the equivalent of if we had like whitehouse.gov, but there was a zero in the house, and that was sort of this um, antagonizing <laughs> activist group improving the White House data site. It's very, it's very clever um, and inspirational. Um, I appreciate um, you being very clear about who sort of sets the norms in the social sector. Something that comes up certainly in the United States. Um, tech culture is this idea of disruption coming from either private sector or even sometimes government um, and not necessarily social sector norms. Um, I don't know, do you have any thoughts about um, private or gov disruption mm -hmm. versus being set by social norms? Yeah, I think uh, when the social sector sets the disruption, um, it's often uh, communicated in a way that doesn't leave anyone behind. 
But when the private sector does so, um, well, it's more like a fear of missing out, right? Only their customers <laughs> are the ones that are not left behind. Uh, and so it's a very different thing. Uh, the social purpose versus the private sector purpose, I think, is really at, at play here. Um, in Taiwan, uh, especially in our counter-pandemic work, uh, we rely on setting new norms, of course. Uh, in Taiwan, we do not have a norm of physical distancing, um, and I, I bet not in other jurisdictions as well. Uh, and so we really need to communicate those norms. But what we did is that we took how the social sector is communicating those norms. Um, for example, at the time, the, the dog meme uh, was uh, really uh, popular. Uh, and so we have a very cute dog, the spokes dog named Song Chai Eshiba, um, who works as a companion dog of the participation officer that's a team of people engaged in trending hashtags in each ministry. We've got around 100 people there. Uh, and so the health um, and the welfare uh, participation officer lives with this dog. Um, and then uh, we look at the memes, uh, and then we uh, engineer the memes a little bit so that we can say, for example, when you're indoor, keep three Shibas away from one another or wear a mask. Uh, and when you're outdoor, uh, keep two Shibas away or wear a mask. And as a plus, um, this dog also tells you, don't do this. Like, don't put your hand to your mouth. Uh, the masks are there to protect your own face against your own unwashed hand. Again, these are um, developed in a way that's social sector. First, we certainly did not originate uh, many of our memes. Um, it came from the social sector, but the state serves as an amplifier, right? It uh, makes sure that the signs, the clarifications, the epidemiological ideas, and so on, can be translated uh, in a way that already speaks to the people, and and I mean this dog uh, is like has intergenerational fan <laughs> audience. <laughs> There's no you know uh, leaving some people uh, in and leaving other people behind. Uh, this is quite universal. It's been translated to like twenty uh, national languages in Taiwan and so on. And so it's maximally inclusive. And so while it's quite disruptive to keep physical distancing or to wear a mask all the times, the create Creativity and the ability to remix in the social sector, in the uh, people-public uh, partnership, make sure that this doesn't leave anyone behind. Mm. Yeah, that campaign reminds me of, in the U.S., there's certainly been um, government Twitter accounts, a few, mm -hmm. that take to this sort of like remixing memes mm -hmm. as part of their strategy. And it certainly um, is an example of one of your philosophies, if I will. Like uh, uh, you've had other interviews about how you believe in humor, over um, rumor. above rumor, right. as a, yes. over rumor as a, a strategy, mm -hmm. and that's an example of that. As well as radical transparency mm -hmm. as being a core ethos. I wonder what your experience has been living those principles in different sectors. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine radical transparency has a little bit more friction to it as a public sector employee than it would when you're an activist? Um, or how do you feel about it? Yeah. Um, well, in the social sector, uh, as part of the free software uh, and then also open source movements, um, radical transparency is really our thing, right? <laughs> the, the idea is that anyone with an email account, uh, well, nowadays with GitHub and so on, you don't even have to have an <laughs> email account. Uh, you can use uh, other social media login and so on. But uh, in any case, uh, this basically means that anyone, as long as they're willing uh, for their contributions to uh, be on permanent record uh, for the descendants and uh, people who read the Arctic fault <laughs> uh, to to uh, look at state they, they gain uh, agenda setting power they can actually set how the uh, pull requests go how the project goes and so on and the power builds upon those spontaneous connections between people who don't really know each other but because of shared keywords shared values and so on they discover from their initially very different positions there are worthwhile things to work on together so that's the core of the organizing principle of the social sector that forms the free and open source movements. Now, in the public sector, the, the, <clears throat> interestingly, um, I didn't meet any resistance because uh, I'm not imposing this on other uh, cabinet members. I'm just saying that each of the ministries can send secondments my way uh, and we work out loud, but we're not forcing anyone to do so. So the upshot is that the people facing ministries, uh, for example, the initially the ministries of culture 
culture of um, finance, public diplomacy, um, national communication, education, uh, you know, the usual suspects. They all send people around 12 uh, different ministries. But for example, the Ministry of National Defense never sent anyone. <laughs> Maybe they're not that used uh, to radical transparency, and that's entirely fine. And so the nature of conversation, I would say, um, really changes because I hold office hours. Anyone can talk to me, booking my time for 40 minutes at a time. And there's also walk-in. And people see that uh, I have this public park as an office. So like literally, they can walk in. We tore down the walls, and uh, this is just this very open space. Uh, but the nature of conversation, as I mentioned, tend to be uh, pro-social. It tend to be social sector and maximally inclusive, simply because they know they will be on permanent record. It will look actually very bad if they lobby for something uh, for this generation at the expense of the next generations, or if they lobby for something within their sector uh, at the expense of other sector, it will look quite bad. So the same dynamic is also at play where the tape recorder or the uh, video cam stands for the future generation or stands for the missing stakeholders at the table. And um, pretty much all the arguments I hear from my office hours and visits and lobbyists are about the common good, the sustainable goods. So maybe last, uh, one of my questions about cross-sectoral work is uh, more about your maybe your personal sure. feelings and like skills involved uh -huh. in each of these um, roles. I'm curious, um, certainly like going from social sector to um, public sector, you're going from more of a participant role mm -hmm. to a, a facilitator mm -hmm. role. And just how does that feel skills wise? Do you have a preference? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you long for a time when you're back mm -hmm. in the social sector? Do you not see a big mm -hmm. difference? How do you feel well, about I'm it? Well, I'm a slash, right? So I'm digital minister at TW slash board member radical exchange slash board member council democracy foundation slash advisory board go of love slash many other things. Uh, actually, seven uh, social sector roles. So, so I'm not missing social sector roles because I, uh, in, in all honesty, uh, I see myself as a kind of Lagrange point uh, that uh, is between uh, the gravity wells of the social and public and private actually sectors uh, and in a way that facilitates communication cross sector uh, but is not captured by the gravity well of any particular sector. Uh, but to answer your question about skills involved, uh, I think the public sector is all about um, like the reducing risk so people feel safe uh, and reducing the chores so that people can listen better, like the more signal, less noise, and so on. And uh, while in the social sector, these are also important. In social sector, we care more about um, the purpose itself, the mission itself, uh, building trust around those missions, trustworthiness, and so on, and less so uh, about reducing risk, less so about this psychological feeling of safety across the entire population. So I think both sectors can learn a little bit from, from each other, because the social sector Sector, can learn from the public sector to if uh, they become de facto public sector as many digital services from Gov Zero eventually became, then we need to take care about people who are of very different cultural backgrounds, very different age and very different digital capability compared to the developers. Uh, we need to be more inclusive and diverse. And the public sector can also learn from the social sector saying, you know, if we have a shared common purpose, like 75% of people have to wear masks and wash hands, then actually the public sector doesn't have to come up with all the answers. We can actually work with the social and private sectors so that they actually contribute to the shared purpose and mission if we can articulate the purpose and the mission in a way that is uh, shaped like a call to action, which is something the public sector definitely can learn from. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a good segue into our, our That's next. Right. Yes. Section. I know I'm a bit ambitious trying to get through all these questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next next sec section is on this this idea of participatory versus sort of passive data mm -hmm. collection. And maybe passive isn't the right word, but I, I feel like participatory probably is. Um, but I've certainly been looking at it in the context of smart cities and um, uh, something that's come up time and time again when I've talked to um, activists from around the world, but many in the U.S., um, a major concern right now is just prolific surveillance and also that it's attached to um, U.S. police mm -hmm. and all the, also other enforcement mechanisms, mm -hmm. ticketing, like all these sort of punitive 
goals of sort of watching, mm-hmm. like big eyeballs on all these policy pieces. Um, and I'm wondering um, mm-hmm. what you you think about um, listening at scale mm-hmm. and how much that is something that looks like this scary surveillance and how much of that mm-hmm. is just sort of um, voluntary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, this is a really good uh, theoretical, even philosophical question. Um, I think listening uh, is a active skill. Someone who listens is actually quite active, right? Uh, you're you're listening to me, and I can see your your attention, uh, the the alert level, deciphering uh, the messages, uh, and uh, trying to segue into the next section, and so on. Uh, and so it involves a very complex, uh, affective, and cognitive, of course, uh, behavior processes, uh, and that is requires a lot of motivation to do. On the other hand, uh, a tape recorder probably doesn't have these skills. Uh, and probably doesn't uh, have motivation per se. Uh, and if it's uh, simply sitting in the background collecting voice, I, I wouldn't call it listening at all. And you, you call it surveillance uh, or uh, surveillance for passive data. And I, I think it's exactly right because um, when the raw data is just uh, audio data, some spectrum waveforms and so on, um, it carries no, no cultural meaning. It is not a social object and so on. Uh, and so when we're listening, we're not listening to data. We're not listening to audio data. I would never describe our conversation this way. I'm, I'm listening to, to your arguments, to your questions, to your feelings, to your reflections, and so on. These are on the meaning level uh, of things. This is, reminds me uh, that I uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago explained that there's no data norms per se, just like there's no text norms. There's a norm for journalism. There's a norm for academic publishing. There's norm for many forms of text, but there's no text norm. It's meaningless if you uh, like abstract it out to the text mm-hmm. level. And the same uh, goes for the data level. So I think the intentionality, the engagement, uh, the active Um, of the listener, I think that's what differentiates listening as a human-to-human action versus data collection, which is ultimately a machine-to-machine action. Yeah, that that speaks to, I think, a lot of um, at least the the up-and-coming local laws in the U.S. are very data or um, tech-bounded, and then they get into um, oversight discussions but outside of the the law itself and they're not contextual mm-hmm, the way you're describing they're very like audio yes audio no um yeah so uh following up on that um i'm curious um what you see um uh, i'm thinking like again in like local u.s news um recent police shootings um that are more available to us um to organize around as a social sector because we have video because we have these other technologies that help us campaign. Certainly technology is not what Mm -hmm. made that possible. Um, People make it possible, but it's a facilitating tool. Um, What what other sort of uses have you seen in Taiwan Mm -hmm. in terms of technology Mm -hmm. providing social sector capacity Mm -hmm. and also ways for sectors to talk to each other. Yeah, I talk about the technology of scanners and uh, computer vision and crowdsourcing OCR uh, turned uh, some very blunt papers in the National Audit Office uh, into issues of common concerns uh, in the social sector when it comes to integrity of the election and election-related campaign donation and finance uh, and things like that, uh, which is a, well, you, you work in sunlight, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. If they, oh, yeah. it, right, if they yeah, sit maybe. as papers papers or, or even like very obscure PDF or JPEG images, then of course people cannot organize any rallies around that. So that's a very clear example. I would add to that saying um, that pretty much anything that allows the social sector to set an agenda about the common situation is a good technology. And I include uh, in my uh, word technology also facilitative technology, such as open space technology, which is the bread and butter of the GovZero 
hackathons. And the OST, well, it, it calls itself a technology, right? It's a social technology. Mm -hmm. And nonviolent communication, MVC, also a interpersonal technology that could be adapted and learned by pretty much anyone. And I would go uh, even far as to say, democracy to me is also a form of social technology. It's also technology. We have voting, which enables three bits per person every four years uploaded um, a very constrained bit rate uh, from the modern standards. But we also have, say, the um, presidential hackathon in Taiwan where we elevate the top social sector and public sectors, cross-sectoral ideas. And every year we give out five trophies, which is the shape of Taiwan, but with a micro projector underneath. So all the good ideas that are cross-sectorally called to action, they need only to prototype that. For example, uh, telediagnosis, for example, in order to reduce carbon footprint, people can use augmented reality to plant trees together. Uh, for example, um, going to a Pokemon Go-like tour, but actually uh, learning about drinking fountains uh, and refilling bottles instead of buying new plastic and things like that. So all these call to action, once they receive the trophy, uh, they can uh, turn on the micro projector and project uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president. <laughs> and, and the president, uh, she hands the trophy to the teams uh, in our ceremony, promising whatever they did will become national level public policy soon as possible, usually within 12 months. And so that's presidential power as a amplifier, as a hackathon prize which I would argue is a much higher bandwidth uh, bit rate compared to just voting. Of course, we're not using hackathons to replace voting, far from it, but we're using hackathons, participatory budgets, sandboxes, many other things to augment and to make uh, that citizens uh, agenda setting uh, more in the here and now. Anyone can start a e-petition uh, in our national participation platform called JOIN. Soon as they collect 5,000 signatures, minister have to uh, come and answer if it's cross-ministerial, we have to meet uh, and things like that. And again, they don't have to wait for, for yes, they only have to wait for like 60 days at most. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, yeah, following up on that, I've heard you talk about um, when folks in the social sector are upset about some sort of government platform, mm -hmm. outrage. Mm -hmm this product doesn't work, they're invited in mm -hmm. to participate yep. um, in co-creating the next version of that. With all of those things that you, you just said, like in mind, how what um, a couple of things are going on in the US that are trending. One is um, our um, surveys for our statistical data sets are getting less and less responses. Mm -hmm. People don't answer telephones. Yep. They're looking for new ways to either um, fund those programs or use other collected data to like augment because uh, people won't respond to surveys. Um, another thing that is like very common in US public comments at the local or federal level is it's this usual suspect. It's not sort of representative of the, the whole population. Um, and there is like a slight crisis of sort of um, bots just sort of copy and pasting the same comment again and again. And is, is that representative or not? There's been a couple innovative techniques like um, I think it was Drexel University was doing some um, sample size surveys for public comment where they really tried to represent the full population demographically mm -hmm. um, and do all this extra legwork instead of come to the meeting at 6 p.m. if you can. Um, I'm curious, like, it ha what do you do to promote participation? Or is, is culture just different there that more people want to participate? And then what work, if any, is done to um, try to make it as representative as possible? Yeah, um, in 2014, uh, right around when we occupied the parliament for three weeks or so, uh, well, that's a sort of engagement, I guess, but the uh, uh, approval rate of the cabinet at that time in 2014 was less than 10%. Uh, and so uh, immediately before the Occupy, say January 2014, if you ask random people on the street, um, they probably don't really care uh, about uh, political engagement. And many people expressed uh, frustration and the same sort of frustration that we see in other jurisdictions today uh, are, are really 
prevalent. Um, in, in Taiwan, a very prominent writer said, even if you know ten thousand people press like on Facebook on the social cause, when it comes to call to action, uh, nobody shows on the street, right? Um, and, and so I think uh, this is something we can sympathize because um, in twenty fourteen it was like that in in Taiwan too, uh, and no uh, design of surveys uh, can cure that. Um, uh, what we found is that people are only willing to actively engage and uh, endorse any survey or any tool, including text filing, um, if they participate in the design process. And and this is really key. This is really the, the most important thing. Uh, the police technology we use, for example, to resolve the dialogue about the UberX situation, um, so that people, instead of debating endlessly about what's sharing economy, should it be gig economy, platform economy, whatever, uh, can actually focus on the common values of uh, insurance, of registration, not undercut existing meters and so on. Um, so the tool that does so, uh, Polis, uh, basically is what we call a wiki survey. It's a survey, but all the survey um, items are other contributor, other citizens' contributions. So it's just like upvoting and downvoting. We crowdsource um, the hundreds of different uh, survey items. And when people press yes, no, yes, no, um, they can resonate uh, with one another much more, visualizing it, and then also propose something uh, that they feel uh, strongly about for other people to resonate about. And so if you structure the survey as a wiki survey, I think much more uh, likely that people will participate and people will also invite their cross-sectoral friends to participate and resonate uh, together. And the important thing here is not just statistical representation, but also that all the uh, minority opinions and feelings are re Presented, it's not representation per se because it's the person holding the feeling actually typing the feeling. <laughs> There's no representative uh, between them and the system, uh, but the system because it highlights um, the minority positions. Uh, as long as they're distinct enough, uh, they don't actually uh, get left behind simply because they can't get five thousand people on their side. Actually, uh, we don't even count uh, the the head counts when drawing the shape of the police conversation. Uh, what you're seeing here is the actual Uber X conversation. Um, the blue uh, circle is the participants, and their friends and families uh, on the social media are shown in different sectors. But the sectors uh, area represents the diversity, not the headcount. So even if you uh, mobilize 5,000 people to vote exactly the same way, the size doesn't change. It doesn't even increase the chance of that particular group's ideas into the shared agenda. You have to convince people in all the different aisles. So what I'm trying to get it is that if we design the interaction carefully, so it highlights in an inclusive way, highlights diversity, then um, you don't uh, need to worry about representativeness uh, that much because no one is obliged to represent other people. Everyone can just resonate with one another. On the other hand, on the more anti-social corners of social media, uh, that uh, design isn't seen, right? So with the reply buttons and with the you know memes, pictures, and so on, uh, people get uh, more divisive uh, over time. And then you don't see this kind of shared uh, common agenda anymore. So I think uh, most of it is in the design of the interaction, and one need to really engage uh, the people who are uh, least likely uh, to engage in the previous paradigm, uh, so that they can co-design the new paradigm and therefore more willingly participate. Yeah, it's like a, a meta answer. Working on the this, the survey design is. How you get people uh, I mean, I mean, I um, saw the pres uh, the the differential privacy being introduced on the federal level, which is great uh, as as yeah. someone in uh, applied computing as mathematics. But because that's certainly uh, from the watching afar, that's certainly not co-designed uh, by the participating states and participating jurisdictions. And, and so that uh, controversy is less on the differential privacy, the, the epsilon value, the mathematical model itself, but rather on um, so uh, what about nothing about us without us? <laughs> Is this design without us? Uh, but uh, in Taiwan, we applied differential privacy also quite early on. The initial V Taiwan conversation about uh, data privacy protection, actually the recommendation was differential privacy, but it was uh, a joint uh, resolution, a joint recommendation uh, by people who actually used to sue each other, <laughs> right? people in the human rights groups 
uh, in the National Health Insurance Agency in all the different stakeholders around the private data and they uh, actually explained uh, that uh, they could switch to better tools. They don't want to make that uh, privacy usability trade-off. Uh, and then people generally understood what pr uh, differential privacy entails and so on, and then gradually made that shared recommendation, much as how we did the recommendation on the UberX situation. Uh, so while the technology is the same, the social technology to introduce it to a national audience uh, was different. And I think that affected um, the popular uh, sentiment as well. Yeah, a common theme of sort of giving space for folks to come to these mm -hmm. consensus ideas on their own. Um, oh, no, we are running out of time. Okay, uh, last data question. I see folks are, are putting questions in the Q&A to start to, to ramp up and do that because we'll pivot over to Q&A. Uh, last sort of data question, since, since I spent a lot of time in um, the open data space, I wonder what thoughts you have um, of sort of government funded data as like a public good for mm -hmm. folks and like what data that should be collected versus not. Um, and also um, an observation that I've, I've had in this space, it's very um, reminiscent of GovZero, um, is um, NGOs collecting their own version of a data set, not just necessarily re-engineering OpenStreetMap or something, mm -hmm. but like uh, a non-government version of a data set um, augmenting or challenging. We had like the COVID-19 tracking project. A lot of our police data conversations have been about like you're missing data. Like what responsibility does the public sector have with its funding to like provide these sources um, and, and and how should that be decided? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Taiwan, uh, basically anything that's not related to privacy uh, or state secret, uh, trade secret and so on, um, is to be published as open data. We have this very strong directive. And uh, soon as I become digital minister in 2016, I also said that it needs to be published upon collection. That is to say, all the system integrators and vendors um, in Taiwan, they already have to build websites that are uh, accessible for people with blindness, uh, that works as well as with people with sight. Uh, that's just non-negotiable. If they say they have to charge a lot more money to build a version that uh, serves people with blindness, uh, they could be disqualified for being unprofessional, right? Uh, and so we augmented that language and said uh, they also need to build a open API version upon request quest so that it speaks to robots and if they say they have to um, you know uh, charge a lot for that they could be disqualified for being unprofessional and discriminating against robots we don't say that but uh, that's the effect so because of this API first design approach it changes the risk uh, matrix the risk formula for the public service because in the traditional Freedom of Information Act workflow, there's some public servant that needs to be there to look at the uh, uh, quality of the data, to vouch for it, to approve its release, to make sure that it's redacted when it needs to read acting and so on, uh, on the implementation phase, on the runtime. And so they tend to be quite conservative uh, in making the data release. On the other hand, if it's released upon collection as part of the system integrator system, then just like our mask availability data in the 6,000 pharmacies in Taiwan, <clears throat> every time people queue in line to buy some ration mask last year, they can use their phone to go to more than 100 different maps and see that for real time, people who swipe the national health card before them, after just 30 seconds at most, the new uh, data, the new numbers gets uh, reflected on their phone and there's no um, oversight from any uh, public servant. Uh, of course, nobody can review every 30 seconds, 6,000 different pharmacies. So it's entirely automatic machine to machine. And so even if uh, people detect data quality issues, data bias, and there's quite some bias in that data, uh, people tend to see it as a joint social object, a social problem that everybody can contribute to solve rather than pinpointing or blaming any particular agency or any particular public servant for missing it because everybody understood that nobody it could be reviewing is just machine to machine. So uh, my idea is that open data needs to be as much as possible open API. And once the API is available, the social sector can develop their own applications and introduce their own data, like building the air boxes that measure air quality, uh, contributing to climate science, and so on, not only augmenting, uh, but also setting their own agenda about decarbonization and things like that. And that is very powerful. And the uh, public sector uh, can 
actually also join the social sector, many GovZero um, data project that challenges the public sector actually is uh, joined by the public servants who join in their spare time, right, when they're off work, when uh, in the weekends and so on. So in a sense, uh, that's a way for the public service uh, to innovate uh, within the social sector. If it doesn't work, they can say, oh, I'm just participating in a hackathon. But if it does work, maybe they get a trophy from the president. Uh, and so to me, I think uh, the public sector can make sure that the infrastructure, anything that's part of the decision workflow, must be published as soon as it's collected. And that radical transparency sets the norm for the private and social sectors. I have lots of questions about that, but we got to keep going. Uh, <laughs> so uh, final sort of segment, and then we'll move to Q&As, and this will be short, but this is uh, just sort of talking about the world more broadly. Um, one of the other reasons it's, um, I'm so um, thankful that you made time to talk to me today about these issues is I look up to Taiwan's work, not just sort of with COVID response, non-data things, but certainly your transition into government and a lot of, sort of the leading um, technical, um, not just um, apps, but your ethos is very inspiring. And I enjoy being inspired by you. And um, you're very generous with sort of your evangelism across the world. I, I see that you speak a lot. But I'm curious um, what inspires you? What other government work or individuals in your life? Where do you um, get inspiration mm -hmm. from? Um, practically speaking, I get a lot of inspiration from the Ethereum community and from my co-board member of Radical Exchange, Vitalik Buterin. Um, a lot of things like quadratic voting uh, that we apply to presidential hackathon, uh, I think for the third year now this year, um, started in the Ethereum space. Um, and uh, I mean, uh, you ask which government, I guess Ethereum is like a government, right? It's <coughs> certainly a co-governor uh, in the blockchain space, but because uh, the fast iteration allowed uh, by the uh, blockchain ecosystem. Uh, they innovate on such social technologies like quadratic funding through Gitcoins and so on in a way that's really breakneck speed that's much faster than any legislature uh, could move. Uh, and so uh, once their uh, ideas, not necessarily all good, but uh, when it emerges um, better practices, then we can actually apply it to uh, real world governance uh, because we um, understand that the required technological conversations as well as social conversations has been in a sense prototyped uh, in the Ethereum um, community. So I'm uh, very inspired uh, by that community myself. Mm. Is it just sort of the, the technology capabilities or also some of the mm -hmm. Um, social technology the part, the, uh, definitely the social innovation yeah. part. So, yeah. yeah, and as for culture, I wrote my poem, Prayer, Job Description, uh, when I was visiting New Zealand. I was in Wellington at the time. <clears throat> I was inspired by the Maori community, actually, uh, which shares some spiritual cultural lineage, uh, the Austronesian lineage uh, from the Eastern Taiwan side uh, for the past thousands of years. And um, I think this uh, Maori uh, relationship um, and the relationship relationship between nature and the governing um, mechanisms. Uh, New Zealand, as you know, has natural personhood, uh, where an entire uh, national park or a river and so on um, has the same legal standing as a company, say. Uh, and that uh, really, to me, is quite inspiring as well as the internet of beings that connects not just things, not just uh, the capitalistic structures, but also natural structures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a there was a hot news story in the U.S. where um, Mark Zuckerberg had a house on a Hawaiian beach, and in Hawaii, the beaches are open to all, not necessarily beach rights, but it was a, a good clash of sort of different mm -hmm. value systems. Um, j just because you brought up Ethereum and blockchain and distributed ledger, I don't know if you have a response to there. There's been a lot of critique about environmental impact. Yeah, yeah, of yes, technology. yes, yes. Uh, from what I understand, that's entirely what Ethereum 2.0 is about to switch to a more in energy efficient uh, way to capture uh, consensus. And I wish them uh, the best luck. <laughs> and uh, it looks like uh, it's, it's on the right track. Uh, this switch uh, from the traditional proof of work system seems to be quite feasible. And because of decarbonization uh, and the energy awareness, 
governance, uh, I think uh, the pressure to implement this transition correctly uh, is also um, quite uh, acutely felt. I actually talked uh, with Vitalik when he visited in 2016, actually just in this living room. Of course, it's on, on the record, <laughs> the video is still on YouTube. And I pointed out that the, the uh, Dao fork, uh, the, the fork of Ethereum uh, over philosophical differences and so on, uh, and with this impending Zoom, people have to scramble to uh, invent new ways to capture consensus and so on. Reminds me a lot about uh, the climate crisis, the climate emergency, uh, because it's an existential thing, but it can't be solved without all the sectors contributing in. So it's like a mini, um, you know, Paris Accord <laughs> that was um, in, in the Ethereum community back in 2016. Uh, and I, I think this is quite important that we feel uh, this shared responsibility, this shared purpose, but also shared agency, like everyone can do something about it. Yeah, a great segue to my last question, and then I'll look to Q&A. Mm -hmm. I only see one in there right now, so I'll just keep asking questions unless folks have, have more to sure. add. Um, but in the spirit of Paris Agreement for everything, <laughs> um, we're seeing um, a lot of different, um, not only uh, data regulation, but internet regulation, trade agreements with regard to our communication mm -hmm. tools globally. It, I don't know uh, if you have thoughts about sort of like if we need a common internet as a baseline or how these different um, norms really, like not just rules, but thoughts like about use of biometrics um, across jurisdictions, they're, they're, they're sort of wildly divergent and, and how you think that um, those are sort of um, going to evolve and also affect the way we handle mm -hmm, global mm -hmm. politics generally. Right. We're on different mm -hmm. pages with our communication tools. Yeah, this this goes way back to the smart city, smart citizens <laughs> conversation uh, in the very beginning of our mm -hmm. conversation. Um, in many so-called smart city deployments, um, the rules, uh, algorithms, code, and so on are not open for forking uh, by the people living in the city. And so in a sense, they lose agency, become less smart citizens uh, because of the smart city deployment. And so uh, the right to city uh, and many uh, movements around that idea yeah basically says that um, anything that concerns the city's uh, arrangement of resources and so on need to be co-designed by the city. Um, in Taiwan, for example, when we introduced self-driving vehicles, um, we didn't start in the fast part, in the trucks and so on, but rather in bicycles, um, uh, actually tricycles. Um, in my uh, social innovation lab for a couple of years, there's um, any number of mobility hackathons involving people looking at self-driving tricycles um, that are are uh, actually smaller uh, than us uh, and can be reprogrammed in a way that's quite um, intuitive. So anyone can actually work with these quite alien looking uh, tricycles. Uh, and I remember a elderly couple um, who just uh, was you know, carrying some orchid flowers in pots uh, because it's the Jianguo flower market, right? Um, next to my office and they said uh, minister what you're doing uh, with those shopping carts and I'm like these are not shopping carts these are self-driving vehicles if you hop on one and tell it where you want to go it's slowly drive through there uh, of course it's quite slow so no accidents no trolley problem uh, and they're like no uh, we don't want to be uh, driven around rather uh, we are uh, the elderly people that don't want to carry the orchid flowers that much I want uh, a shopping companion I want this uh, shopping carts to follow us so that I can can buy some flowers, put in there, and once it's full, uh, it can form a platoon, right, to invite uh, new ones uh, to follow us. And based on this uh, norm, we co-designed it so that it actually shows uh, the active listening, like which person they're following, uh, they have to interpret uh, the hand gestures and, and gestures and so on. And of course, um, that norm is co-created by the people, the local people in the Jianguo flower market, and which says that it need to yield first to the elderly uh, and then uh, to uh, handicapped people and then to maybe pregnant women and then maybe to children. But uh, when the original designer, these were from MIT Media Lab, run the same survey, the same uh, co-creation uh, exercise with people in Boston, they all said that it need to yield to the children uh, and nobody care really about the elderly. So <laughs> in each society, there's very different norms. <clears throat> and when we're applying right. the smart citizens way of thinking, I think what's common is actually the methods 
that we use to design such local agreed norms. But we should not unify the norms because that reflects the cultural lineages that people want to uh, preserve. And these are quite important for people to make sense of technology. And if the technology is appropriate, they must be able to be appropriated by the local people according to their local norms. But the way to form such consensus on the meta layer, that's something we can agree on as the core norms of the internet. Um, awesome. Okay, I'm going to questions now. So questions um, first from uh, Curtis McCord. Mm -hmm. How important is making clear commitments as possible outcomes of the engagement? So this was mm -hmm. when we were talking about um, consensus tools. Mm -hmm. And what is a good starting point? So. Yeah, a good starting point uh, is at the beginning of the design process. You know, the double diamond, the, the ideal um, idea. So <clears throat> we, we discover uh, the whatever positions that people have. We commonly define our shared values. And then uh, we start to explore uh, various different development options. And finally, we deliver the service that's the standard double diamond. So the best starting point is at the very, very beginning when nobody knows uh, what to do, when nobody knows what other people think, when nobody has a theory of mind of other stakeholders, that's the place to start a consultation, a conversation. If you start a consultation at the very end of the process, that becomes bike shedding, right? That becomes just arguing what color to paint the product. Um, but whether we need such a product in the first place, well, that could only be done in the very beginning. So <clears throat> the idea of the participation officer is to uh, make sure that when people uh, start to see something, for example, um, many uh, young people less than 18 years old, uh, they're responsible for more than one quarter of citizens initiative now in Taiwan, um, say that we need to ban plastic straws uh, from our bubble tea takeouts and so on. Um, that may not feel uh, as important as other political issues, but obviously there's some young people just 16 or 17 years old that can actually speak to people. And if you don't respond to them right away uh, and wait until like five years later, uh, then during those five years, maybe they stop attending school on Fridays and go to the streets on Fridays, right? Uh, and, and so right before uh, we even um, have any idea of what to do with those plastic straws, we just start the engagement process. And that's when people really feel that, oh, they actually has agenda setting power. And so that's a very good starting point. And we commit to hold uh, to our ourselves as accountable as possible to talk about only the agenda that's set by the citizens in such initiatives. That is to say, we will never um, say those um, agenda are out of bounds that we don't want to explore together. We would never say uh, that this is our agenda and it's um, you know higher than your agenda, so we'll just talk about what we talk uh, want to talk about instead. We make very clear delineation of the scope for the citizen initiatives, so uh, the presidential powers, the uh, national defense, um, you know, uh, diplomacy and so on, these things are <coughs> off the table because it's not the duty of the administration, but anything domestic, anything that within the administration, we hold ourselves to account to talk about only those that are set uh, by the social sector, by the citizens' initiative. So that's the level of engagement of our complete attention to talk about nothing but uh, the citizens' initiatives. I hope that answered the question. Yeah. Um, next question. Um, as you implement your uh, impressive and inspirational changes within the Taiwanese government. How are you thinking about making those changes sustainable mm -hmm. beyond your own personal tenure in your role? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm really designing myself out. Um, so uh, basically, whatever we did, uh, the participation officers, the uh, national participation platforms, the uh, presidential hackathon, and so on, uh, I'm not maintaining it uh, It's by myself. Uh, this is uh, the collective work of hundreds of participation officers. and uh, in many like agencies level, like not ministers level, the third and fourth level, uh, they also have their own uh, participation officer team so that they can make sure that uh, they adapt the national regulations about participation officers into their uh, ministries or agencies uh, culture. So this is really a cultural movement that uh, listening and skill actually reduces risk and save time 
so that people have more time to rebuild trust. So I'm pasting our participation officer website, including the full directions and so on, and you can uh, look through our collaborative meetings uh, from uh, this webpage. It's in English. Um, and so I hope this gives uh, an idea of how what we're doing is really changing how the public service itself uh, interacts with people. They're not here to work uh, for me. They're here, the participation officer are work with me, uh, and I'm working not for the people, but rather with the people. Um, and so it's these um, voluntary association that binds us. So uh, in the collaborative meetings now, we're at almost at the hundreds of collaborative meetings now. I, I play no part whatsoever other than to hold the space. Yeah, a follow up. Um, if anyone else has another question, or I'll do Mark's second question too. Um, Related to that um, that statement that you just made about um, holding space and having to work with so many people for any of this to happen, I know um, part of what um, made it possible for you to join the, the Taiwanese government was uh, the Occupy mm -hmm. Sunflower yep. movement and all the pressure and new, new political changes. Like if new mm -hmm. people were not elected, you, you would not be in the role mm -hmm. that you are in. So yeah. I'm maybe also in the spirit of Mark's question, um, what what had to happen to make all these participatory tools in, in Taiwan possible? And relatedly, like, what haven't you gotten done mm -hmm. yet that you're hoping, sure. hoping to do? Th th that's an excellent yeah. question. I think what it takes is a successful demonstration. And uh, demonstration, I don't mean it as a protest, rather as a demo for people who have tuned in to the live stream during the 2014 Sunflower Movement, people understand that the 20 NGOs, each facilitating conversation from one aspect of the trade deal um, with Beijing, um, actually um, benefit a lot from more people joining. Uh, so instead of the traditional thought about, you know, people going nowhere, the Occupy movement going nowhere, it's all noise, uh, the no agenda means that there's no signal, they never agree on anything, you know, those common um, stereotypes about Occupy movements. Uh, the demonstration was uh, actually, you no, know, within just three short weeks, we agreed on four demands, not one less. Those demands were uh, ratified by the head of the parliament. The Occupy was a success. And in the following national forum, on economic affairs, everyone agreed that the controversial issues to, should be tackled uh, way before it passed the parliamentary floor. It should be tackled, uh, all the different regulations and so on need to be tackled first on an online platform so that people don't have to occupy the parliament every single time, but with the implied outside game that says if the administration doesn't implement such mechanism, well, we'll be back, right? So that successful demonstration and the outside game, I think is the political uh, structure that uh, needs to happen before the administrative structure um, can happen. But nowadays it's very firm, very solid. In 2014, uh, it's true that I was invited as a reverse mentor to the cabinet, but the cabinet was at the time uh, still uh, the uh, Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang. Uh, nowadays, of course, the cabinet uh, is uh, from a uh, DPP president, and the KMT, the DPP, uh, and also the other <coughs> two parties, the TPP and the MPP, uh, within the parliament, they just last month signed on this open parliament national action plan. So. Uh, deepening democracy in this way and uh, building international links. Uh, these are the two topics that all the four parties directly commits on and they compete on doing this more, not on whether they this needs to be done or not. And so this is a very clear cross-partisan consensus, pretty much the only two things they can agree on nowadays. Uh, and then, uh, we're operating within this political mandate that says, uh, so it also needs to happen in local level, in the municipalities, in the townships, uh, even district level participation is important. And I think that points to the next uh, steps, the next few years. What we'll do is that we'll make sure that people who were previously excluded, people who are younger than 18, I talk about those people, immigrant workers, uh, indigenous people whose uh, um, native language is neither English nor Mandarin, and so on, they all need to participate in a way that feels comfortable uh, on their terms, not on the terms of the national government government or the municipal governments. So that in deep inclusiveness, that's also something we need to work on in the next few years. And I'm really happy that all the four major parties are behind this vision.
Yeah. I wonder, um, looking um, to your work in Taiwan, if it's like an alt reality I know, from, I know. from what I've experienced I in the U.S. If might yeah, we've been be post-pandemic for almost a year now. So mm -hmm. we're literally in the future, well, I guess. Certainly, <laughs> <laughs> certainly in that regard. Yeah, but many regards. Mm -hmm. um, just sort of having like um, political appetite to build these um, democracy um, capacities. So not just mm -hmm. all types of technology, you talked about the social technology mm -hmm. and the other things. Um, I guess last question to close this out, if folks have another Q&A um, related to this line of thought is, um, I actually, I, I have no idea how you're going to answer this. I'm, I'm okay. very curious. Um, if you had um, advice or hopes for jurisdictions mm -hmm. broadly, um, you, you'd use that um, the tricycle example is like hyper local mm -hmm. norms. And you've talked a lot about um, democratic capacities, polling tools, day one mm -hmm. um, consultation, right. open legislation, mm -hmm. open uh, budget. Like what um, would be sort of the priorities that you, you would want other jurisdictions to be able to mm -hmm. foster? Yeah. Or are you like, that's not my mm -hmm. business, it's up to them, mm -hmm. but yeah. Well, um, to give no trust is to get no trust. So my main suggestion would be trust the citizens more. Uh, in many jurisdictions, especially in light of infodemic and pandemic, there's some um, justification, I guess, about the more authoritarian movements that people feel like the state just has to intervene. But um, intervene is, 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 of course, necessary. Uh, but there's a difference between intervening uh, with the people or intervening for the people. And uh, in any jurisdiction with uh, speech freedom, the freedom of assembly and so on, there's also, if you really trust the citizens, the approach of working not for the people, not with the people, but after the people. Right? When the social sector discovers something new that needs to be done, instead of co-opting them, uh, bless this way of doing things and say, oh, those social entrepreneurs are now part of our infrastructure team and so on. And that, of course, uh, requires a redefinition of the word infrastructure that would include the OpenStreetMap example you just pointed out, right? That any infrastructure definition that includes the OpenStreetMap, I think, is fit uh, for the jurisdictional response against not just disaster recovery, but just everyday sense making. Uh, back in 2016, I worked with the Minister of Culture and so on, uh, and the Premier at the time, uh, to convince the National Budgeting Office that if uh, we build something and that's not concrete, like not made in concrete, uh, but just made out of bits, as long as these bits can be shared in the commons using Creative Commons license, as long as its production is in the commons so everyone can participate, it should qualify for infrastructure status uh, in our then new Infrastructure Special Act. It's a special bill that defines infrastructure. And it's very counterintuitive for the National Budget Office, but they eventually came around to it uh, and the digital part of the infrastructure bill is very special in that it doesn't have to contain any um, you know tangible investment uh, part as long as it's in the commons like OpenStreetMap is and it, it's not necessarily started by the <coughs> procurement relationship it could be started by the social sector in a reverse procurement relationship we fulfill the APIs necessary uh, for those projects to happen all these qualify as infrastructure uh, status and and that's what enabled Taiwan um, during the infodemic and pandemic to have national level conversations on social sector designed and operated infrastructures, uh, the digital equivalent of town halls and museums and universities and so on, rather than forcing ourselves to have the same conversation on the digital equivalent of nightclubs, right? Uh, Facebook with addictive drinks and very loud noise and private bouncers and things like that. So we're not forced to use the digital nightclub. Uh, as digital public infrastructure, we actually have digital public infrastructure. So that view, that trusting the citizens to build infrastructure together, that would be my main advice uh, to other jurisdictions. That's great. You've given me two memes tonight, Audrey, the smart citizen, and then also I, social sector as infrastructure. Mm -hmm. What is infrastructure mm -hmm. has been very memeing lately. So I thank you for that. And I thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. um, 
think we have one more question, but we can answer that mm -hmm. offline because we're over time. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and live long and prosper. Bye. You too. Bye.